So what is wage slavery? Because, you know, every interview, every um, debate I do these days, and it's, it just seems to have just popped out because I've been doing debates for a long, long, long time. And I have to say, the term wage slavery never came up. Now, I'm familiar with the term because it goes about back to Karl Marx and, and even before Karl Marx, but certainly Karl Marx, uh, Marx or Engels popularized, I've got a couple of quotes from Engels where he popularized the term. Uh, it goes back to the antebellum South, to the, to the, to the South during slavery. Uh, it, it's got roots in the labor movement of the late 19th century, early 20th century. But I really hadn't seen the term being used regularly in the United States by people on the left. And yet, just recently, every single debate I do, I mean, really, every single one of them, the issue of wage slavery comes up. And every time it does, it shocks me anew. Because what is wage slavery? It's a term used to describe a situation. I'm reading from Wikipedia, but you can find this. I mean, it's the same thing. I've checked a number of different sources because I don't typically just trust Wikipedia. It's a term used to describe a situation where a person's livelihood depends on wages or a salary, especially when the dependence is total and immediate, which means what does total and immediate mean even? It has been used to criticize exploitation of labor and social stratification, with the former seen primarily as unequal bargaining power between labor and capital, right? particularly uh, low-wage wa wages like uh, sweatshops and the lack of worker self-management, fulfilling jobs and leisure in the economy. Fulfilling jobs and not enough leisure in the economy. And the purpose is, and here I'm not reading for Wikipedia, the purpose is obviously, it's in the term, to associate wages with slavery. Now, I think that's pretty disgusting. Now, to, to realize how Discussing an offensive that is, and, and that's what I said to Vosh. Vosh kept saying, wait slavery, wait slavery. Um, think about what it means to be a slave. It means every aspect of your life, every second of your day, is at the control of your, quote, owner of the person who is your master. Uh, uh, female slaves were raped regularly with no legal recourse. Slaves were whipped, beaten, killed with no legal resource, recourse. They were treated as property. They were owned and they anything could be demanded of them. And if they refused, their punishment was violence. If they ran away, they were brought back, beaten, often hung, and killed. Slavery is the brutal use of force to force people, to, to force people to do your bidding. I cannot think of a human institution more evil than slavery. Not treating human beings as human beings, but treating them as animals, treating them as sub-human. Indeed, much of the defense of slavery in the South and around the world has been that they are subhuman. It is not an institution one voluntarily enters into as a slave. It is associated with violence. Married couples were separated, sold to different owners. Marriage had to get the consent of the master. Children were separated from their parents and sold. I mean, only a, a, a you know, middle-class spoiled brat 
who do not understand, and who has not thought, who has not used his mind, to think through the meaning and the significance of what slavery is and what slavery meant and what slavery represented. Now let's think what wages are. Even wage labor, even in the worst circumstances, let's take the worst. Let's take a sweatshop, Southeast Asia, or early factories in England or in the United States. Just think about the difference. People were toiling on land. They could barely make a living. It was not very efficient. Opportunities came up in the city. Opportunities to work for somebody else for X number of hours a day, and early on, it was many hours a day. And in sweatshops in Southeast Asia, it can be many hours a day almost as many hours a day as a first-year uh, employee at Goldman Sachs. I think it's 100 hours a week, which is what a Goldman Sachs, new employee at Goldman Sachs, uh, is expected to put in, uh, fresh out of business school, right? They, would, they went, not because they were expecting a worse life, they went to the city because of the promise and expectation of a better life. A life that would earn them a living that was higher and better than what they were earning being on a farm. They went to the city and took jobs because those jobs had been created. Those jobs did not appear out of nowhere. Those jobs were not a consequence of some social evolution. Those jobs were not just something that had to happen. They were jobs created by entrepreneurs, by business people, by capitalists who provided capital to set up factories that then employed, then employed people Well, then employ people and provide them with wages attractive enough to lure them from the countryside for a better life in the city. In those days, there were many new businesses being formed. And labor, at least to an extent, could choose who to work for. And they were compensated based on how good they were, how productive they were. In spite of what Voss says, it's generally how people are compensated. The, the more productive you are, the, the more you produce, the more resourceful you are, the better you are at what you do, the more money you gain. They chose to be there. They were not forced to be there. And they could leave. They could switch jobs. They could, in theory, even go back to the farm. They ended their labor, their work day. They could go home. They could do what they wanted. They could marry who they wanted. Nobody forced, nobody sold off their children. They made enough money, they might send their kids to school. If they didn't make enough money, they might have their kids working as they did on the farm where the kids worked because they now lived under better, better conditions than they did out in the country, in spite of the romanticization of the countryside. As a consequence of living at a higher quality, uh, uh, you know, had, having more money, and the improved sanitation, and just in, generally the improved life in the city, they lived longer, they lived healthier, life expectancy rose, children didn't quite die at the same rate, Wealth was created. Some of that wealth was funneled into things like sanitation, into things like health care. Doctors were trained. 
and civilization arose. Yes, people worked at jobs they didn't like. People have always worked at jobs they didn't like. The only difference between today for people who have jobs they didn't like is that 400 years ago, they didn't know there was an alternative. They couldn't conceive of an alternative. There was no alternative. They did the work they were born into. And they would always do the work that they were born into. They would never make more or less. They would die with about the same stuff as they had when they were born. No wealth, or very little wealth, was actually created. Workers in the 19th century died with much more than what they began with. Their children died with much more even than what they had started with. And indeed, the standard of living went up constantly in spite of these, these so-called slave wages. These were voluntary transactions. They could leave. Nobody beat them. Nobody whipped them. Nobody raped them. If they did, they had legal recourse. They had full rights under the law. Now, not to say they weren't abuses, not to say that they some... Uh, you know, bad people exploited other people. But generally, the system was such. That people had rights. That people protected by the legal system. The exact opposite of slavery. We went from a feudal system. A system which, unless you're an aristocrat, nobody had rights. Aristocrats had privileges. This is where the word privilege comes from and why I hate the term privilege applied today. I hate the term privilege because aristocrats have privilege. They could do what they wanted. The law didn't apply to them or it applied to them only when somebody above them felt like applying it to them. The commoners had no rights, and no law applied to them except the law of the master. They were closer to being slaves. But once the feudal system was broken up, once people were freed to engage in activities that bettered their life, they were no longer slaves. So it truly is horrifying to think of voluntary interaction. Voluntary interaction that, uh, uh, that if, if done right, improves one's life. Voluntary interaction that restricts one's behavior, if you will, by contract, by voluntary agreement, to a certain fixed number of hours a day. To, 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 to imagine that that is slavery is disgusting and despicable. And let me point out importantly, dishonest. It is dishonest. Now, on some sites, I've seen wage slavery only applies. Now, according to this description, wage slavery pretty much applies to anybody who receives a wage, including the CEO, who, by the way, receives a wage. A high wage, but he still receives a wage. And some CEOs do not get stock options, might not even have stock, which is bad, just receive a wage. Are they wage slaves? But I've seen the term applied only to those people who do jobs they don't like doing, they don't want to do. But the beauty of the world in which we live is that if you apply yourself, and you see lots of examples of this, if you apply yourself, you have a choice of kind of jobs available to you. And all over both geographically, both type of job. You can get better at your job. You can rise up and improve and get to the point where you do like the job. I mean, almost every job is not particularly likable early on. One learns, one gets better. Yes, there's a bunch of 20-year-olds who are baristas in Starbucks and 
dream of being, I don't know, rap stars. I don't know where rap stars came up, but anyway. You know, some glamorous, wonderful profession that allows them to make gazillion dollars. Do they do anything to change their profession? Do they invest in themselves? Most of them do not. But they imagine, they want, they wish, they desire. And because they desire, they don't, you know, they, they don't enjoy what they do. They don't look for realistic jobs that they might, yes, enjoy. And they get themselves stuck in life. They lose all meaning to life. And they are upset. They resent the world. They resent reality. They certainly resent capitalism for putting in the position where they either work in the barista or they have to go to their parents' basement or be on welfare. They don't even starve today. So what we want to talk about is some of the roots of this attitude, where it comes from, and uh, the various sources, the various elements that make it as evil as it is. Let me give you a few quotes just to show you that this is, uh, this is, uh, his, this is not just a modern phenomenon, although I think it's on the rise, and I think I know the reason it's on the rise, but we'll get to that. Uh, this is from Engels. Engels, of course, was uh, Marx's uh, wealthy benefactor, partner in crime, friend, associate. Uh, Marx basically lived off of Engels, and Engels lived off of his uh, wealthy parents. Marx didn't really work other than write books, that, but he, 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 without the funding of the benefactor, he couldn't got in anywhere. Um, Engels writes, the only, dif the only difference as compared with the old unspoken slavery is this, that the worker of today seems to be free because he is not sold once and for all, but piecemeal by the day, the week, the year, and because no one owner sells him to another, but he is forced to sell himself in this way instead, being the slave of no particular person, but of the whole property holding class. You're selling yourself when you negotiate to work for somebody? Yeah, he sounds like Vosh. No, Vosh sounds like him. Don't, don't give Vosh too much credit. This is Engels. This is Paul. Oh, this is uh, socialist royalty. It's slavery when you negotiate? The human condition under nature is poverty. The human condition under nature is work or die, hunt or die, grow stuff or die, pick berries or nuts or die. That is not an invention of capitalism. That is not an invention of civilization of the modern world. You either apply yourself to living, which requires work. Even animals work. They hunt. Now, they know how to do it, and they're not very ambitious. So a lion eats X amount, and 2X is meaningless to him because he has nothing to do with the extra. There's no advantage. But for human beings, there's an advantage to working more, earning more, achieving more. The advantage is material comfort, access to spiritual values. Human beings have lots of advantages of accumulating more rather than less. But to accumulate more, to live a more comfortable life, to be more successful at living, requires work. That's just metaphysics. That's the nature of reality and the nature of man. And it requires work and an effort in a way that you don't see a lion express, 
or an animal generally express. I mean, they just seem to be lazing around and eating the, not lions, but I don't know, the zebra just eating the, the, the grass or whatever. It's because man does not have, for, there are two reasons. One, we're not satiated easily. There's so much more. We can achieve so much. We can improve our lives by so much that we don't stop. We keep accumulating. And second, we don't have it automatically programmed into us how to achieve, how to survive, how to create. We need to figure it out. We need to work at it. And then we need to go work to do it. Now, instead of having an appreciation for that, for a hard man must struggle in order to survive, and how he has struggled, for hundreds of thousands of years, at least tens of thousands of years, to survive and to slowly get better and to slowly advance and to slowly achieve more comfort, to slowly achieve more security, to slowly achieve more privacy and a life. And then to see the last 250 years when man has accelerated the progress in ways that are just unimaginable. The last 250 years where human life has gotten thousands of times better, where wealth has gone up by 300 times, by 300%, but in terms of quality of life, by thousands and thousands and thousands of times. For people to look at that and say, and see, see, slaves is insanity. Now, you can somewhat, and I emphasize somewhat, because you can't really. Okay, Engels was writing in 1845. It had just started. The magnitude of the success of the next, of the next 200 years was unthinkable even to Engels. They couldn't see it. So they were mistaken. All right, maybe. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think they were purposefully blind. But today, with the amount of wealth and comfort we have to talk about wage slavery for workers who have iPhones, air conditioning, automobiles, homes with roofs, give me a break. More from Engels, the bourgeois. Let, uh, let him have the appearance, uh, the bourgeois lets him, the worker, have the appearance of acting from free choice, of making a contract with free, unconstrained consent. As a responsible agent who has attained his majority, find freedom, where the proletarian has no other choice than that of either accepting the conditions which the bourgeois offers him, or of starving, of freezing to death, of sleeping naked among beasts of the forest. Why are those the only choices? Why can't the worker come up with an idea of himself and start his own business? Why can't he go back to his farm and grow food? And who are these bourgeoisie and workers? Know that Engels, as do all of, uh, all of these leftists, they only talk in terms of groups, collectives, classes. There is no individual business owner and individual employee. No, there's all business owners exploiting all of employees. There is no competition between owners for labor and the ability of labor to switch owners as they prove themselves more productive and compete. None of that. Completely evaded, completely thrown out. All they see is groups, collectives, masses. And what they miss is reality. What they miss is facts, truth, what's actually going on in the world. What's interesting is that this idea of wage slavery was part of the South's defense of slavery, of real slavery, actual slavery. This is John Calhoun, 
one of slavery's worst apologists, well, not apologists, defenders, the liberty of the northern wage earner amounted to little more than the freedom to sell his labor for a fraction of its value or to starve. Again, labor starvation. Putting that down. But it's not labor starvation. It's labor starting your own business, going back to the farm, hunting. It's reality that has created the conditions that say work or starve. Not man, not capitalism, not the North. Indeed, the South claimed that they treated their slaves much better than factory owners treated their workers up North. That's part of their defense of slavery. Here's, uh, here's uh, uh, George Fitzsimmons, also a um, defender of slavery. He wrote a book called Cannibals All or Slaves Without Masters. This is 19, 1857. We do not know whether free laborers ever sleep. They are fools to do so. For whilst they sleep, the wily and watchful capitalist is devising means to ensnare and exploit them. The free laborer must work or starve. Oh, my God. He is more of a slave than the Negro because he works longer and harder for less allowance than the slave and has no holiday because the cares of life begin when his labors end. He has no liberty and not a single right. God, you can understand the evasion of slave owners. You can understand people trying to protect a slave society. I mean, it's truly, truly amazing, right? Um, the amount of evasion. It turns out Leon, uh, Tolstoy used, uh, he wrote an essay, Tolstoy of War and Peace, wrote an essay called The Slavery of Our Time, where he compares, compares wage labor to slaves. And you can see this throughout the 19th century. And then, you know, labor unions use these terms. Of course, if they were slaves, how did they have unions? How did they get to form unions? Slaves don't have unions. Slaves don't negotiate. Slaves can't come together. It's just, it's just <laughs> astounding that people can't see the difference. Well, they can't see because they will not look. They can't see because they will not think. The evil of it is truly astounding. And what does it achieve? It achieves the demeaning of labor. It achieves the demeaning of wages. The demeaning of working for a living. As Voss said, why can't I just not work? I mean, this is an anti-concept. Wage slavery is an anti-concept. Both aimed at destroying, which is aimed at destroying the difference between voluntary transactions that labor engages in, laborers engage in, and slavery. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think, meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the role of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes, 
that should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support, or on Patreon, or Subscribestar, or Locals, uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value, hopefully, you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.